Good morning. Welcome back to our final day of web. Um, after a series of exciting presentations throughout the past two weeks, we have another one more exciting talk from Dr. Carl Lawson. And I would like to give a quick introduction of Dr. Carl before I hand over the mic to him. So Dr. Carl Lawson is an assistant professor at University of Science, King Abdullah University of Science and Technology right here in Kaust. Carl did his doctorate at Bellefield University in Germany and his master's in the Queen's University in Queenstown, Ontario. So he moved from a pretty cold country right to Kaust uh, about a year and a half ago. And through his research, Carl has made innovative advancements in enabling reliable transgene expression from eukaryotic green algal nuclear ge genomes for the first time. And what's even more impressive is that through his research, he has opened up new possibilities for other research groups to engineer these hosts as well. So at KAUST, his group focuses on sustainable and synthetic biotechnology, with their main research focusing on the engineering of the algae to become green cell factories. So I myself collaborate with Carl on integrating his microalgae systems to wastewater treatment processes. And the main intention is to use his genetic engineered microalgae to convert waste streams to valuable products. And so this is just an example of an endless stream of benefits one can derive from synthetic biotechnology, especially through his research. In this lecture, Carl will be talking about synthetic biotechnology and how it looks at the chemical value from nature and also to explore ways to use biological resources to create more sustainable solutions for everyday consumer products. And I'm sure we're gonna benefit a lot from his presentation today. So without any further delay, let me hand over the microphone to Carl and or, or maybe the screen session to Carl and he can start with his presentation. Okay, thank you very much, Peng, for this lovely introduction. I uh, am indeed here to talk to you about biological interconnectivity rather than just connectivity and in engineering sustainability. So I'm going to share my screen now. The uh, tech guys can tell me if I'm doing it correctly. Um, looks like looks like we're sharing. Good to go. Okay, hello everyone, and thank you for joining us on your last day of WEP. I hope it's been a wonderful uh, event for all of you who have done it for the first time. I'm very impressed with the in, in incredible organization that went into this meeting. So congrats to uh, the entire WEP team. I think they've done a great job. I guess there's a lot of other activities still to go today. And for those of you who are joining us as, uh, as students, this is your, I guess, one of your last academic talks of uh, WEP. So I hope it's entertaining as well as informative for you. And I'm going to break my own rule and start my talk with a slide full of text. This is not something that we recommend doing in the academic world, but I'm going to read it to you so that you uh, know what we're talking about. And the crux of my talks in my today is that we are all interconnected. And as technology continues to link us in ever more connected ways, it is important to understand that living organisms are also connected at the molecular level. Our metabolism stems from central blueprints, which enable the basic processes of life. Those central pathways are shared among all organisms, creating universally required biochemicals that link us in ways we may have overlooked or take for granted. And so our work focuses on the fact that central metabolites are building blocks for specialization. And these specializations link living organisms in a myriad of interactions in behavior and in biological composition. So basically throughout my talk, I'm going to explain to you why trees, grass, shrimp, and my cat are all more or less the same at their central core and how we can mix and match and use that all together. So this similarity arises from the fact that we're all evolved from a common ancestor. And so if you think about existing as a biological organism, there are some, some uh, basic processes that have to happen. And all of our metabolism stems from the first organism which was able to exist as a biological being and figured out this metabolism. There's been specialization in different environments and we're gonna talk about that. But basically the blueprints that we all um, stem from are shared amongst all organisms. And when we think about biological blueprints, which is most common for those of us in biology to think about DNA and its code, 
And we all shared uh, some kind of DNA that codes for all of our biological processes. But at another level, this DNA codes for molecules, biomolecules, proteins, RNA, that allow chemical reactions to happen, biochemical reactions. And that's another blueprint in cellular metabolism. But rather than a genetic code, what we actually have is a metabolic code or a metabolic roadmap that happens in living tissues. And so you can look at this massively complex blueprint of cellular metabolism published by Roche, and there are many different versions of this. And you don't have to zoom in or look at any of the details to know that a lot of things happen inside a living cell at any one time. And we can group these metabolisms into different biochemical um, biochemical functions. So for example, we have carbohydrate metabolism, amino acid metabolism that codes for the building blocks of proteins. And all of these different metabolic processes have different roles. Now, the metabolism of the cell is something that happens between the building blocks of the cell. So you can see here this animation published in 2010, which models what happens in the cytoplasm of a bacterium. And you can imagine that Metabolism is the interactions that happen between all of these different um, cellular building blocks within this, much like having a crowded football stadium, something that we can't imagine now in, in COVID times, but uh, think about it as a busy, busy downtown city street filled, full of people, maybe at New Year's Eve or um, it, after, uh, after a big celebration. And then the metabolism is what's happening in this space. So common metabolisms are common central functions of metabolisms are shared across all organisms. Even though we're very diverse, you can see many different examples of cartoon renderings of bacteria, insects, fish, people, algae, plants. But those common metabolites are used by all organisms to make specialized functions. And so what I want you to gain from my talk today is that an understanding that when we look at biology, the things that we see in front of us, the beautiful colors of flowers or their smells or the because of these uh, autumn leaves or the pink in this flamingo are all connected at their base root of cellular metabolism. And in fact, I'm going to give you a little uh, spoiler alert for the future, but the pink color in flamingos and the pink color in salmon are actually the same chemical compound. So when an organism eats, so an animal consumes something or a plant takes in CO2 and through the dark reactions of photosynthesis converts that CO2 to carbon. One of the first metabolites that it makes is a three carbon building block. So that three carbon building block is in one example, acetyl-CoA, it's one type. You have G3P and pyruvate, which are two other types. But those three carbon building blocks are rapidly created into higher molecules in the cell and they participate in a myriad of functions. And one of those conversions happens in two different ways, whether it's from acetyl-CoA or from G3P and pyruvate, to make the same five carbon building blocks. So the cell is able to go from three carbons to five carbons. And these five carbon building blocks are called IPP and DMAPP. They have much longer chemical names, which I'm not going to bore you with. And these five carbon building blocks can then be used by the cell as a template to then do all kinds of crazy, interesting biochemistry. So what's even more interesting is that different organisms have evolved different ways of building these five carbon building blocks. So in bacteria and uh, certain organisms, you only have what's called the MEP pathway. So from these three carbon G3P and pyruvate, you can make five carbon IPP and DMAPP. And in animals you have, and in things like uh, yeast, you have MVA pathway only. And the MVA pathway, takes acetyl-CoA, which is just another three carbon building block that comes from the breakdown of fats and turns it into a five carbon intermediate, the exact same chemical five carbon intermediate. And plants benefit from having both of these pathways because they have a photosynthetic uh, chloroplast, which is derived from a cyanobacterium. And so this is a rather complicated slide. All I want you to know is that the cell, all cells in the world are able to make three carbon into five carbon as a common metabolic pathway that's shared amongst all or organisms. And so from these five carbon building blocks, they're like a substrate that can be turned into many different things that the cell needs. And because they're five carbon, the cell can add them together and make 10 carbon. 
and also keep adding on to them and make 15 carbon and 20 carbon. So these chemical backbones then serve as uh, something that the cell can use and modify. And these are present in all living organisms. So for example, the 15 carbon building block is converted by cleaving off this carrier group, this double phosphate group here, the pyrophosphate. It's cleaved off by the cell and two of them are combined together to make a 30 carbon molecule called squalene. Now squalene is actually an essential molecule that's existing in all cells, all membrane, uh, at, because it's required in membranes. And so if you try and get rid of this function in the cell, the cell will die. It's an essential part of all living organisms. So squalene is essential because our membranes, you could hear a cartoon of the phospholipid bilayer. Our membranes have a hydrophobic region and a hydrophilic region. This is why they form this double layer. And squalene actually rests inside this hydrophobic region and adds functions of fluidity and the ability to cope with uh, uh, changing temperatures. And so squalene is an essential compound and it's found in very high concentrations in a lot of the oils we consume. So it's about 20% of olive oil and even 30% or more in shark and fish oil. So it's an essential hydrocarbon and it's made from those universal five carbon building blocks by sequential addition. In humans and uh, other organisms, it's also the basis for sterols. And so this is sterol, which is the base compound for things like cholesterol. And you can think of cholesterol as what we all think of having too much of when we get older and how we have to avoid it. But cholesterol is actually a very important molecule in terms of uh, our horm hormonal regulation of development. And so these are essential functions which are derived from our very basic carbon building blocks. Another example is in plants. The C20 carbon geranyl geranyl pyrophosphate is used as a backbone for all pigments. And so the first thing is that these C20s are combined into a C40. And then that C40 is converted into different shapes based on different uh, reactions in the cell. So lycopene is a 40 carbon uh, molecule and beta carotene is a 40 carbon molecule. And you would know these best as lycopene being the red color of tomatoes and orange uh, color of carrots. And that's why it's called beta carotene because it was first discovered in carrots as being the main component of that pigment. So another example of how plants then take these com common intermediates and turn them into something else or the diversity that can come from these common intermediates is that beta carotene is a cleavage, uh, can be cleaved to make even other products. So a lot of plant hormones, but more specifically, one like beta eanone here, which is a very uh, fragrant molecule. And it's actually one of the key components that we smell when we smell flowers. And so the cell has all of these creative ways of taking these early building blocks and turning them into specialized functional products that it can then use uh, to interact with the world around it. And so it's not limited to these pigments, but plants have especially been prolific at making these different hydrocarbon products. And you can see here pictures of structures on plants that are called trichomes. And trichomes are the hairs that extend from plants. And they actually accumulate a lot of these hydrocarbon products that are made from these central intermediates. So just to give you some examples, you have these different hydrocarbon products being produced by cinnamon and clove, which ward off insects from eating them. And so there's a diversity of products created here. In lupins, you have the production of R-limonene and transosamine, which ward off aphids. And you can see accumulations of uh, hydrocarbon products in these hairs, these trichomes that are on plants. And things like orchids also produce a, a specialized product called cineol. And cineol is a monoterpene and it acts as an attractant for pollinators. And cabbage produces the same product from the same building blocks but they do it to attract not pollinators, but another type of flying wasp, which will in, uh, lay its eggs inside the caterpillars that eat cabbages and work in some kind of uh, defense rule. So natural products, especially those from plants, are highly diverse and they have many, many applications. So some are medicines, some are pigments, some can be used as biofuels. And I wanna to talk to you for uh, the next little bit of my talk about this works in the cell. How does a cell take these common intermediates and turn it into these specialized chemicals that you see in front of you? 
So something that you need to uh, kind of internalize when you're thinking about biology is that chemical modifications are controlled by enzymes and enzymes are coded by genes. So remember we have, we all have DNA in our cells and that DNA codes for proteins. Those proteins can be enzymes. And so from a gene, you have the description of that gene into RNA, which is then translated into a protein. And those proteins are biochemicals. They're amino acid-based biochemicals that have a three-dimensional structure. And that three-dimensional structure can have active sites or pockets where different hydrocarbon chemicals or different chemicals can sit within. And I'm gonna show you a kind of fancy looking diagram in the next slide, which is um, an enzyme from humans. And that enzyme has a three dimensional structure. So those amino acid chemicals, this is what's called a ribbon diagram. So we're presenting the structure uh, as its most likely shape based on uh, uh, crystallography. And these amino acids have side chains and those side chains are simply chemicals which can then interact with the, the molecules of a target substrate. And so what we are able to do is, uh, or what cells are able to do is using the sequence of their amino acids interact with chemicals in a very physical way. And so the other thing that you have to internalize is not just that chemical conversions happen by enzymes, but enzymatic chemical conversion is modular. And so from a starting compound, the steps to make higher functional uh, metabolites like these ones here, this is just a hypothetical, doesn't actually exist in nature, um, final metabolite, but the steps to get from a precursor to this final product happen in a modular fashion in which most of the reactions are individually catalyzed by individual enzymes. And so in different organisms, what you have are these universal precursors. These are found in all organisms from C5 to C20. And they're also built by enzymatic conversion. But different organisms that live in specialized environments have evolved special enzymes, which can then take that precursor and convert it into specialized compounds. And so, for example, you have a terpene synthase, which makes limonene. And limonene is found in citrus fruits. It's one of the main components of the aroma of orange peels or lemon peels. You have here, patchouli, which is a perfume product produced by uh, a plant from a C15 backbone. And amazingly, this one enzyme is able to not only cleave off this uh, double phosphate group, but it's also able to make these complex cyclic uh, moieties by bending around that carbon backbone and adding on this alcohol group. And you have here another more uh, uh, fancy product called manual oxide. And manual oxide is made from the 20 carbon intermediate shown here. And so then what happens in um, evolution is that these precursor molecules can even be further specialized. So from manual oxide, you can have an enzymatic conversion that adds an alcohol group to it. And then through a series of other uh, modular enzymatic reactions, you can have even fancier decoration. We call this chemical decoration of a precursor. And so this final product, forskolin, is actually made from enzymatic conversion of four different enzymes after manual oxide is made. So this is how cells in nature are able to make specialized chemicals from universal precursors that are found in every organism. And what we can do as synthetic biologists is actually capture these specific metabolisms and bring them into easier to handle systems. So I want you to imagine that you have a medicine produced by a plant, but that plant exists only in a very specific environment or it grows incredibly slowly. It may not be possible to bring that medicine to a broader audience or to make that medicine chemically and recreate these very special chemistries through traditional chemistry. So what we can do is we can take the genes from that original plant and we can adapt them to a more easy to handle host so that we can produce either the precursors, which we can then modify chemically, or we can produce exact biosimilars of those products. And this process seems very simple, but it's actually quite nuanced and quite complicated. And so it all depends on the host organism you wanna use. But the point is that we can go from maybe a, a plant that's very difficult to grow or slow growing, or comes from a very specialized environment and we can't destroy that environment, and put them into an easy to handle engineered host. And usually we're talking about a microbe like a bacterium or a yeast here. 
So getting these genes from one organism to another requires a little bit of understanding of genetics. And for those of you who are biologists, I'm sure you're already saying, okay, Kyle, get to the point. But for those of you who are biologists, all of our proteins in our cell are actually coded by three letter codes called codons. And so that A, T, C, and G of DNA is grouped into these three nucleotide codons. And those three nucleotide codons code for individual amino acids. But in different organisms, we all have DNA and DNA is the universal language of living systems, but DNA also has dialects. And those dialects arise from the fact that the third position of these codons is highly variable. So you can have CAC for a histidine, or you can have CAT for the same amino acid. And so this arises, this um, generates what we call a GC variation or a GC bias in different organisms. So some organisms have very high GC content, meaning that this third position is usually a C or G, and some have more moderate. So they're usually an A or a T or some mixture of the two. And so when we bring a gene from one organism to another, we actually have to respect this because the protein won't be created if the cell doesn't have the ability to handle certain ones of these codons. And so we can do this, we can use what's called DNA synthesis to bring genes from one organism to another. And this is really what has opened up um, synthetic biology in the last 10 years is the ability to print DNA. So DNA is actually just a chemical and it's a chemical that has a lot of different properties but can be made uh, fully synthetically. And so this is a single strand piece of DNA on the left-hand side here. And what we can do is design a target sequence in silico, which means in a computer. So we have a genome sequence from a specific organism and we can take its specific gene and we can recode that gene to be more amenable to uh, the host that we wanna put it in. And so we can build synthetic DNA by making short fragments of chemically synthesized DNA. So we can do about 100 to 200 nucleotides at once, relatively straight, in a relatively straightforward manner. And then we take the sequence that we want and we make overlapping fragments of these small chemicals. And through some uh, through the reaction called PCR, we're able to stitch these all together and make completely synthetic genes. So this ability allows us to take a gene from one organism and express it in many different organisms. And what you can see here is a bacterium cartoon, a yeast cartoon, a plant, this is a tobacco cartoon, it's used as a model organism, and two algae down here. So again, all of these metabolisms stem from central metabolites. And since we have the central metabolites in all organisms, we can bring pathways into a target host and produce the same specialized compounds that we would from one organism into another. But how do we get those genes? That's a real question. And uh, one has to have a little bit of understanding of biology to know that the genes in our genomes are transcribed into RNA, which I discussed before. And that expression of those genes happens differently in different cells. So you can see here the trichomes that I showed before, the hairs that are on plants. The expression of genes is fundamentally different in these cells as they are in photosynthetic tissues. And what that allows is for the cell to specialize different tissues into different metabolic uh, conformations that give rise to what we see here. And so if you have many different plants that you want to find a special metabolite in, you can do analytics, what is called GCMS. And this tells you, yes, the metabolites are there, but you have to do a genome sequence. And on top of that, you have to do a transcriptome sequence on the specialized tissues you wanna look at. So for example, the medicine is only accumulated in the flowers or it's only accumulated in the hairs of the plant. And so we can do this with high throughput sequencing. Now we can sequence the transcriptome and map it back to the genome and find genes that are more highly expressed in these specialized tissues, which may be related to uh, the biosynthetic pathway that we're looking for. And so I wanna introduce two different uh, researchers to you from different parts of the world who do this kind of work. One is Bill Romoller from the University of Copenhagen. And so he's been working for a long time on many different pathways. He's also responsible for the uh, pathway for vanilla flavoring. And so if you have synthetic vanilla powder, it's likely responsible uh, that Bauer was responsible for discovering the genes that made its synthesis at scale possible. 
So uh, Bureau has been working on aromophilia diterpenes, which are these molecules here. They're very highly specialized molecules with different medicinal properties. And what they were able to do is go to Australia and sequence many different plants from this uh, gene. And they have many different uh, phylogenies related to a common ancestor. And so by mapping the genes that they found with what they see in their chemical analysis, they can group and relate families that are from the same plant or same or related species to each other and then find commonalities in their genetics. And what that commonality allows is for a more ease of identification of the actual biochemical pathway for one species that's related to one different product. And so this is ongoing work and um, I, I don't wanna give away the end, but basically they're able to use high throughput sequencing and phylogeny as well as doing high throughput um, analytics of the, the metabolites that are coming out of those different species to recreate the specialized chemicals that these species are making. I want to also introduce Professor York Bullman from the University of British Columbia in Canada. And York was interested in figuring out what allows sandalwood trees to make the fragrant oil that they do. So sandalwood is a hemiparasitic tree. It grows on the roots of other trees, as you can see in this plantation here. And it produces a very fragrant oil called sandalwood oil. And this is very commonly used all over uh, Asia and India. And it turns out that the oil is only produced or the, the fragrance is only produced in the center of the tree in what's called the heartwood. And so what York was able to do is using um, just some very low tech drilling inks, go in and get live tissue from the center of this tree. And he was able to compare the transcriptome, the RNA expression of genes in the center part to genes in the outer part, which then allowed him to identify the genes responsible for the production of these compounds. And so he found that one enzyme, the santaline synthase, makes these four compounds uh, that are all derived or closely related, but have slightly different aromas that are the main contributors to the smell of sandalwood oil. And then he was also able to identify the downstream genes, which then further functionalized these compounds into the other components. So sandalwood oil is not just one fragrance, but it's actually a milieu of different fragrances produced by these genes. And so they were able to recapitulate this in yeast and make sandalwood smelling yeast. And they can scale that up and make an alternative uh, source for sandalwood oil instead of having this rather unsustainable, very slow growing tree producing this fragrant oil. So I've told you that we can build synthetic DNA. We can put that into a microbial host and then we can reproduce or recreate those same metabolites in that host. But what I haven't shown you is how tedious and time consuming this can actually be in the lab. So once you have a, a dozen or a hundred gene candidates, you still have to express each one of them in a microbe and you still have to grow it up and you still have to do the analytics. And so this cartoon up in the top right corner here just illustrates that once you have the first gene that can do the first chemical reaction, you then have to start co-expressing those genes in your microbial host until you find the complex map of the target genes that then combine to make the final product that you're interested in. And so this can be done in many different hosts. Bacteria and yeasts are most common and tobacco is used because you can actually transform just the leaf and get a temporary expression of your gene so that you characterize things quickly. My lab works on algae. And so this is a cartoon of a green algae here. And we work on algae because algae use light and carbon dioxide, just like plants for growth but they grow in liquid culture and they're much more simple to cultivate, or they're much easier to scale up than plants. And so from very simple inputs, you can get a range of different natural outputs, but also we can talk about engineering them to produce these non-native biochemicals. And the goal is to use algal technology. You can see here some examples, algae grow in liquid culture. These are some cells, these are on plates, these are in the lab uh, at different scales. And then you can scale those cultures up into outdoor farming-like systems where you have growth of algae using waste carbon dioxide. So usually it's from an industrial process and you're capturing that waste carbon dioxide using the power of sunlight to drive photosynthesis to make products. And so in my group uh, previously in Germany and as well here, 
we've been working on different biotechnological applications of green algae and their engineering for different bioprocesses. So we've been able to recapitulate on the upper left here uh, uh, genes for perfume biosynthesis in algae. And you can see a silly stock photo that we made of algal uh, cells being used as a perfume. We've been able to produce hydrocarbon biofuels. We've been able to produce other alkanes and alkenes based on modifying the fatty acids of the membrane. We've been able to make these medicinal diterpenoids, which you can see up here, which I talked about before. We've also been able to do some fun things like secreting recombinant proteins. And most recently, we've been interested in modifying the pigment composition of algae to make them uh, attractive as biomass with different components. And all through this process, we learn about the cell and how carbon moves through it. So I wanna go back to this photo of tomato and, um, and carrot and talk to you about pigments again. So in algae, we have these same pigment components. We have lycopene and we have beta carotene, but we also have many other uh, derivative compounds which are used as part of the, the photosynthetic apparatus. So in carrots, you only have beta carotene accumulating and in tomatoes, you only have lycopene accumulating in high amounts because these cells don't have to do photosynthesis anymore. But in the green photosynthetic tissue, you have a lot of accessory pigments that do a lot of other side products, uh, side, side roles. And so in a certain alga, there's a type of alga that produces a red pigment called astaxanthin, and it does so only when it's stressed. So it's a relatively okay growing, but kind of slow growing alga, and it produces this red pigment when it's stressed. The problem is that it also produces an incredibly hard cell wall around itself, which makes that pigment harder to access. So earlier in my talk, I talked about flamingos and salmon, and it turns out that when um, the food of shrimp or flamingos eat this alga and shrimp then eat that food, the rotifers, they bioaccumulate this red pigment. And so there's an incredible uh, value to using this pigment as a food supplement to make salmon a little bit more pink. It's also the same color that makes salmon pink. So if you farm salmon, it's not as pink as wild salmon. And it's because the cells don't get, uh, the, the salmon do not get enough of this algal uh, food that the food for the salmon doesn't get enough of the algae in its diet so that you have this kind of missing accumulation or bioaccumulation of this pigment. And the reason this pigment is so important for these organisms is it's a natural antioxidant. So it captures free radicals and it, it breaks before other components in the cell break. And there's other applications for it as a, a potentially organic sunscreen and all kinds of applications for medicines using this, it, its biomolecular properties. So this alga, it's not the one that we work with. It produces this pigment, but it's kind of hard to cultivate and it's slow growing. And when it produces the pigment, it's very hard to get the pigment out of the cells. So what we want to do is put it into a microalga that we work with that does not accumulate this product, but is easier to break apart and easier to get access to this pigment. And so what we were able to do is to overexpress a gene that codes for the missing step in its biochemical pathway. And we were able to convert already in our first trials, our green cells into these red cells. And so what you're seeing here is an agar plate with our individual colonies coming back. And you can see on the bottom, a liquid culture of scale up of one of those colonies compared to the unmodified strain. And so now we have a producing strain which is making this product, but it's easier to handle and it's easier to use and it's easier to lice. And so if you um, just treat these cells with a little bit of detergent, they break open and you can get access to your cells. And even for feeding them to uh, the microorganisms that then are fed to shrimp, the microorganisms are able to eat these and break down their cells and accumulate that product at a much higher rate than um, of the native producing host. So using algae, we're looking at producing a, a range of different chemicals in a sustainable way. And the idea is that we're using carbon dioxide to grow the algae and light. And that light can come from LEDs, it can come from fluorescent bulbs, it can come from the sun. But the important thing is, is that that light is used as energy to power the capture of waste carbon dioxide. And so the idea then is to scale up eventually. And coming to KAUST for me seemed like the most amazing opportunity because actually here in the environment, we have the perfect preconditions for doing algal biotechnology. We have access to water, 
land that's not being used for anything, and a lot of sunlight. And of course, the Red Sea provides an incredible diversity of untapped microorganisms, and hopefully we can find new microalgae here that may have even more fun and interesting phenotypes. So to wrap up my talk, I just want to reiterate to you, we all share central carbon metabolic pathways, which are evolutionary ingrained in the way that our bodies deal with uh, existing in space as biological organisms. And those metabolic pathways have different functions that are grouped here. Today, we've only talked about one portion of this, and you can do the same kind of synthetic biology with amino acid metabolism, nucleotide metabolism, and get many different products out. But the important thing is that cells use those common intermediates that are found in all of them from stemming from the central metabolism to deal with the world in different ways. And so we're all connected at a molecular level, whether we think so or not, based on the fact that we all have a common set of rules that then dictate how we're able to use our metabolism to interact with the world. And so many different organisms around the world produce many different things. And through the, the biological facts that these metabolisms are controlled by modular gen genes, which then make modular enzymes, we can bring those metabolisms into from specialized environments or from specialized organisms into more easily to handle hosts. And so I hope I've been able to uh, explain to you a little bit more why shrimp and trees and grass and my cat are connected at a molecular level. And I hope that when you look at biology now or look at any organism around you, you think about it not as just what it is, but what it contains as well and how related we are and how good we are to each other. And so with that, I'd like to end my talk and say thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Carl, for your very nice presentation. I've learned a lot. And we've got a couple of questions, but maybe before going into the more technical question side, just as a general curiosity, um, you mentioned just now the Red Sea can be a source for LG. So are there any interesting, exciting projects that are upcoming that you would like to share with us that maybe you can share with us? Sure, yeah. I mean, bioprospecting is a very big part of what we're doing. And so bioprospecting involves going out and taking water samples and concentrating them down and trying to see what kind of uh, photosynthetic organisms work in there. And we're working together with the core labs, the biological uh, biosciences core lab to use their fluorescence activated cell sorter to take our water samples and identify individual cells that we can then gr grow up. Um, there's been some previous work by people working at COWS who have done similar things and different strains, which we've been able to get back from the various culture collections in order to um, grow them up and see what kind of phenotypes they have. And we're also expanding our, our work into macroalgae because macroalgae are different types of algae that have three-dimensional structures and are not microorganisms, but have equally interesting biochemist biochemistries. And so there are some very interesting macroalgae in the Red Sea that have unique chemistries that we'd also like to tap into as well. So it sounds like there's a lot of bioprospecting at the initial stages before you dwell into the genetic engineering side. Exactly. And so the thing about, uh, you know, I, I spoke about this GC content and the adaptability. Every organism has, uh, especially algae, have very different gen uh, genomes from one another. And this is because they're very old organisms ancestrally. And so you can think about it this way. One common ancestor made all plants and all algae but the branching from higher plants and algae happened very early in evolution. And so algae are actually very unrelated to plants genetically. And algae also exist in states where they can be primary or secondary endosymbionts. And what that means is a symbiont is an organism that's consumed another one and both exist in one way or another and the genes are exchanged and then you have a new organism formed. And so in, in the broader umbrella of algae, you actually have not only one symbiotic event happening, which gave rise to photosynthesis in the chloroplast, um, but you have two or three happening, and then you can have tertiary or secondary endosymbionts. And then their genetic context is incredibly diff different than the green algae that we work on that just has a single a symbiotic event happening. And so 
every organism you want to work with, you have to develop your own set of genetic tools for it. And so genetic engineering comes um, after you've identified a species of interest that grows robustly, is easy to handle, does not die from fluctuations in the lab or you know, um, mistakes in handling, and may or may not have features like a very light cell wall so that it's easy to work with, easy to break apart, or a really hard cell wall so it's easier for industrial processes. Mm -hmm. So this pre this pre-bioprospecting screening is a very important part about identifying new species for biotechnological applications. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like it can be a bit complicated without the right expertise. So I guess some just now you've also mentioned about how robust the algae needs to be for certain applications. So one of the questions was more with regards to how stable do you think the introduced genes and the genetically modified uh, organisms are going to be in an ecosystem. It may be a natural ecosystem or it can be an applied ecosystem. So I guess we're talking about very different um, elements to it. I guess in a nature, natural ecosystem, perhaps the question should be more gearing towards we don't want it to be too persistent. Exactly, and then yeah. Applied ecosystem, then of course we want it to be very robust and it's something that is within our control. So how do you play around with that? Uh, that's a fantastic question. And so um, I have to insist that we have no intention of releasing any uh, modified organism into the environment. And what we do is when we engineer them, we do it in a way that gives them some genetic limitations. For example, they can't exist without the supplementation of a certain amino acid, or they can't exist without the supplementation of something so that if they do escape, they die. Um, and what we, what we do is um, there's many steps in getting an organism to be genetically modifiable. And usually it involves turning off a lot of its defenses that it would have naturally accumulated over time. So the green algae we work with, for example, has been mutated many, many times since it's, um, since it's been taken into the lab in 1950. And so it's heavily domesticated. Uh, that domestication means that it's not very good at competing with other organisms either. So things will eat it very quickly. It will be destroyed very quickly. And um, in addition to that, we have mutated it in a way that the repression of foreign DNA is turned off. And so what that means is that our uh, modified genes are very stable in the organism, but the organism itself needs to be kept in a more controlled environment in the lab or else it dies when you... Um, introduce it to what we call contaminants. So the small microorganisms that would eat the algae because it lacks a cell wall. So it's very easy to chew on. It's very easy to digest. So it's a, it's a multi-level issue in which you have to consider biocontainment. That's a very important one. There are genetic containment things that you can program into the cell. So for example, um, we knock out the ability to grow unless we give the cell arginine. And arginine is an amino acid. It's not uh, super readily abundant in the environment. And so if the cell doesn't have it, it just dies. And these kind of um, uh, stop, stop gaps will prevent that cell from proliferating in the natural environment. And we also have to think that the natural world is an incredibly uh, tough place for any organism to be. So competition and um, natural selection play very uh, prominent roles in the environment. And so in the event that something does escape, it's actually very rare that it's not just completely taken over by natural forces already and destroyed anyways. So, yeah. But then on the flip side, it will mean that it can be quite challenging for certain applications as well, right? It depends on what you're trying to do. So for things like wastewater treatment, um, it's helpful to have a very robust strain that doesn't get broken down by microorganisms. But you are, all, are also working in a contained system. So wastewater treatment also has multiple chemical steps that kill microorganisms that are in it before it ever gets to uh, human use again or reuse again. And you're doing so in a controlled reactor inside a, inside a facility that's for it. So you can work with different organisms for different applications, but have to design the bioprocess for that application. Mm -hmm. So the designing aspect is also very, very important as well. So we have one question that says it's a rookie one, but I guess it's not. So I'm just um, going to share this as well. And perhaps you can provide some technical input to 
that. So it's asking with regards to the current high throughput techniques, how much time does a project, like what you have described, that combines the sequencing, the compound characterization for some target compounds, like for instance, biofuel, how, how long do you think this whole bio-prospecting, genome sequencing and genetic engineering usually will take before a product can possibly be commercialized? Commercialization is uh, a whole other ballgame. So mm -hmm. let's, let's say uh, maybe let's, throw out the commercialization. Yeah, so um, I think it really depends on the preconditions of your lab, right? If your lab is specialized in genome sequencing and gene identification, maybe it only takes a year to go from plant material to full curization of the pathway. But that kind of work can last an entire PhD, four years, depending on um, you know, the luck of science, depending on how, if your machines are broken, depending on whatever. Um, once the pathway is characterized, generating the strains only takes a matter of a couple months. And with algae or yeast, it's very easy to scale up those systems. So we can, for example, we can put a three or four enzyme pathway into algae in about four months if we're really aggressive about it. In yeast, you can do it in about a month because they grow a little faster and they're eating sugar, so it's easier to handle them. Um, but yeah, with algae, um, no yet commercial process exists from an engineered algal system, uh, eukaryotic algae. Cyanobacteria, there's a couple companies who have tried to produce ethanol at scale uh, and they've had not great success with it, but the engineering of scale-up processes for photosynthetic organisms is a whole other area of um, engineering science, which requires um, more complex engineering and, and planning because you have to get light into the culture. And so with algae, the more dense your culture gets, the harder it is for light to get in. And so you have to design very thin cultivation equipment so that light can penetrate at a, in an efficient way. And so in my opinion, I believe that we're going to, uh, that algal scale up works only in places where energy is inexpensive. So places like Iceland where uh, geothermal energy makes electricity incredibly inexpensive or here in the kingdom where electricity is very inexpensive because um, the variability in environment outside is very difficult even for regular agriculture. And so when we're talking about microorganisms growing in bioreactors, it's always better to have controlled lighting. And so I think if we can power LEDs based on solar panels, we'll have much easier time scaling up than we would just having a field with bioreactors that would get dusty and prone to all kinds of issues with the weather. Mm -hmm. But that also means that um, for microalgae reactors, for instance, let's say if we want to scale up, that we also have to consider the footprint that's needed, right? I mean, considering the design of the the reactors that you needed to be a certain depth in order for the light to penetrate very well. It means yeah. that perhaps you need to spread it out and that also can provide a certain element of constraints in very highly, already densely packed places in terms of the uptake of the LG biotechnology. Would that, would that be fair to say or that are ways? Absolutely, absolutely. So, I mean, geography determines everything, right? So for example, we, we work heavily uh, with um, the National University of Singapore in terms of planning synthetic biology, but uh, they have no land space. And so algae is not exactly their preferred organism to work with. Uh, whereas here in the kingdom, we have so much unused land that it's hard to argue that, uh, that it wouldn't work here. And so geography definitely determines that. Um, and again, I think that the resources that uh, can generate the preconditions are here, right? We have uh, direct access to the Red Sea for a reliable water source. We have lots of sunlight to power electricity. So I think, yes, planning is important and algae have its challenges. There's a reason um, algal plants are not commonplace, but the push towards algae has only been about 30 years. And only really in the last five years have we been able to engineer them in a way that brings another level of value beyond having just algal biomass. And so um, we are looking to the future to see what we can do. And we're, uh, my lab is heavily focused on expanding the capacity of the alga to produce different products and producing them from carbon dioxide. So we have a project right now on the conversion of carbon dioxide to isoprene, for example. And isoprene is a five carbon building block for all kinds of chemical 
um, modification in the future and can be directly used as a fuel. So if we can go from CO2 to a hydrocarbon fuel catalytically where the cell is just taking in the CO2 and giving off the hydrocarbon, that's a very valuable system to work with. Okay, thank you very much, Carl. Um, I think we have asked uh, a lot of questions already. So perhaps I just want to have a reminder to the other participants who are still with us now. Today is the final day and we have the gala. So remember that you would have to join us again for the final gala. We do have a performance with James Blunt and I hope to, that everyone will be able to join us for the final gala where we will also be announcing the video competition winners. And with that, I would like to thank Carl for his time and having a great talk. Thank you very much. Bye -bye. Thanks everyone.